Now we come to Victor Lewis Smith, and there is a oh, long-term look, connection. Tell, could you tell us that poem about Australian fine dining? No, no, I save that for after dinner speeches. Oh, um, right. There's a long-term connection between uh, the me Messrs Smith and Harris. Victor is up the line in York, and will give us a suitably vague explanation of that connection very soon. But uh, first, here is a loose ends health warning. Eileen Porter of Belsize Park has written to me as follows. My enjoyment of loose ends would be greatly enhanced if you went, would, when you introduce Victor Lewis Smith, mention how long his contribution is likely to last, so that I can switch <laughs> off for that period of time, and then <laughs> rejoin the programme when normal speech is returned. Well, Eileen, Victor's piece is exactly seven minutes, but he will then be talking to Rolf Harris for approximately three minutes, which is virtually the end of the programme. So it could be off to the shops for you straight away. But I hope not. Come in, Victor, and remember you've been told by the nice Mr Garnhouse not to plug the Victor Lewis Smith Loose Ends book anymore. He has, however, written this introduction for me. Victor, is it true that the Victor Lewis Smith Loose Ends book is in the shops right now? Yes, Ned. And am I right in thinking that it is 128 Eight pages of side-splitting humour mm. and badinage. Can't argue with that, Ned. And would it be fair to say that it's a bargain and a snip at £6.95, Victor? Yes, sir, E. And would it be fair to say that you are the main recipient of all royalties? Hold on a sec. Hold on. That's not in my script. It's Saturday morning, my luxury old penthouse cliché. I browse through my copy of the Radio Optimist and tune into Radio 4. Let's face it, it's gone downhill recently, and with the latest financial cutbacks, even Eugene Fraser has been forced to sack his old scriptwriter and employ a 15-year-old on the YTS. Switch on Radio 4, will you, Tribbly? And this is Eugene Fraser, welcoming you to a choice of listening here on Radio 4. Oh, if you tune into Radio 4, 1500 metres long wave, oh. you can hear me saying silly words. Oh. And on VHF oh. FM, we ask... <laughs> Right, Crazy, you're a past tense sort of a guy. Now bung on my rating savings masterpiece on Radio 4, or I will connect the nipple clamps back to the car battery. Oh, well, better switch it on. Mm -hmm. But I warn you, if it gets boring, it's coming straight off. Never mind about that. At least my scripts are wacky, zany, and off the wall. Oh, oh did you hear that? I did. Airs and graces. Crazy. My scripts off the bleep wall. wall. Yeah, he scripts off the wall, off the wall. You like toilet paper, that's off the wall. I can tell you like well, toilet I paper. i tell you what, I wouldn't like me dirt on one of these scripts, I'll oh, tell you. Oh, you don't, oh, I don't know, the things they get up to in that loose, loose ends office. office. It's disgusting. <laughs> Yes, ladies, and you're not the only ones to wonder how the humble loose ends office can produce such high-quality programming. Let us eavesdrop on the talented team last Thursday as they plan another hour's entertainment. Uh, oh, no. God. Got any ideas for guests yet? No. Yeah. Anyone oh. written a book this week? Uh, yes, we have, I think. Crap. Yeah. Oh. No one else has written any. God, else got any ideas? Oh, no. He's out of it. He's out of it. He's been oh, no. on the cleaning fluid. No, I saw him drinking Domestos. Yeah, see, you know, could you get the book out, please? What is this book? The Sacred Bible of Chat Shows. Let me explain in bibliographical terms. It is commonly believed that the lowest form of chat show life is six guests who have all published a book and are desperate to plug it. But there is one rung even lower down the evolutionary talk show ladder reserved for weeks when nobody has even published a book. This is the anniversary syndrome where entire program themes are built upon the tenuous fact that exactly 20 years ago today, by an extraordinary coincidence, it was May the 21st. Producers simply tell the secretary to look up in the book what was happening on May the 21st, 1968, and Robert's your father's brother. Nostalgia makes for cheap radio. No inspiration required, least of all, from the producers, who can thereby spend all week in beer shops throwing foaming pints of electric soup into their boat races. Oh, what is he on? Well, eh? It's Radio 4, isn't it? He's no, on... no, I didn't mean that. I mean, I mean drugs. What's he on? Oh, I don't know. I think poppers. Yes, for this reason, we've decided to launch an occasional series entitled The Loose Ends Kids' Guide to Nostalgia. Part one, as we delve into your rather revolting parents' psyche at a time when you kids were just a glint in your father's contact lenses. <laughs> hey, man, listen, all property is theft, yeah? Twenty years ago, in 1968, your father wearing crushed velvet purple flared trousers and love beads and your mother wearing a shade of beret and army boots could be heard declaiming the following phrases outside the LSE. Property, all property is theft, yeah? All Whereas 20 years on, they can be heard declaiming the following phrases inside the TSB. All right, all right man. Right, oh, that's super. So you think you can swing us a third mortgage then, can you? And back to 20 years ago with Daddy on vocals and Mummy on sitar. OK, what we need is a great big melting pot. Love your fellow man, whatever colour or creed, OK? Yeah, dig it. And back to today. You know what? We've got bloody jippos on the village green. They're going to bugger up property prices. Bloody Labour Council are doing nothing about it. The bone idol. The mine's a pint. Yes, kids, it's called hypocrisy. You see, mine is about seven and a half inches when folded, and as I say to all... Eugene Fraser here. I did warn you I might switch off this program if it got too dull. You see... 
People don't realize the power of the continuity announcer. We... We run the place. Do you hear me? We... We have the... The power. The power. The power. <laughs> the power. <laughs> BBC will last for a thousand years. A thousand years, the forefront will never perish. We will extinguish all the commercial and fear the radio station. Oh, he's touched. Oh, that Eugene Fraser is touched. Touched the right, he should be in Barley Lane. No, no. He should be in Wally. He used to have a drink problem, you know. Oh, really? Yeah, until he brought a great big funnel. There's no problem at all. Problem at all. Oh. The Loose Ends Kids Guide to Nostalgia Part 2. Bygones. Consumer durables no longer available, with which your parents used to make their own entertainment 20 years ago. Product number one, Escalado. Escalado. <laughs> Escalado consisted of a long green strip of plastic turf which was G-clamped to a dinner table. A handle and ratchet at one end transmitted vibrations through the turf to six gaily coloured horses. Come on, the red Come one! On the one. Come on, the red one! Come on, giddy up, Dobbin! Giddy up, Dobbin! But the horses would often gallop sideways, backwards, or in any direction other than towards the winning post. Invariably, the winner would topple over and cross the finishing line on its side, the whole scenario resembling a knacker's yard during an earthquake. And since the horses were made of sweetie coloured lead based paint, the juvenile contestants would suck them and end up on their sides, sounding like this. <laughs> Product number two a good old fashioned clip around the ear. A good old fashioned clip around the ear. You may have heard very old people like your parents happily reminiscing that in the good old days all miscreants were punished with a good old fashioned clip around the ear. These ear clips were like car clamps but for the earlobes and were dished out by Bobbies in Her Majesty's Police Force at a time when even the lowliest constable was voice trained at RADA. Hi there, don't be a fool, Johnny. Put down the gun. Here, I'm going to clip your ear. There you are. These circular ear clips pierced the lobe and closed up the ear hole completely, leaving the wearer deaf until they were removed a week later. Product number three, the stylophone. The stylophone. <laughs> The stylophone was an electronic organ the size of a half-pound box of chocolates. With a flat embossed keyboard played with a pen-like stylus, famed for its versatility, it could play virtually anything, the bassoon part in the Rite of Spring, for example. <laughs> or even the flute obligato in Debussy's La Primidi d'Enfant. Just so long as you didn't mind everything sounding like a bee being masticated by a cat. There was an optional vibrato setting, which gave the illusion that the bee was suffering from Parkinson's disease. So why is the stylophone no longer available? A, because the well-known artist and antipodean musicologist, Dr. Rolfington Harris, from the Department of Fine Arts and going <laughs> at the University of Western Australia, decided to advertise it extensively on television. B, because we've already said it sounded like a bee. And C, because a gentleman called Mr. Robert Moog and his wife, a strange woman called Walter Carlos, invented their own very much better stylophone, which cost $600,000 million more than the humble £9.18 and six demanded for a conventional stylophone. More bygones over the next few months, Ned. In the meantime, I leave you with this tune by Horst Jankowski, himself a bygone, and pose this philosophical conundrum. What is the difference between a cow and the Horst Jankowski big band? Answer, a cow has the horns at the front and the arsehole at the back. Over to you, Ned. <laughs> <laughs> Victor, you uh, you first appeared with uh, Rolf Harris, aged eight in 1968, didn't you? We, we can was, now mm, all work out how old you are. I was known as the stylophone kid in the 60s. I was, um, I was nine, actually. Do you, do you remember, Rolf? We I had a, a liaison in Paris. I do. He I hadn't do. remembered until we told him. Yeah, well, yeah, well it's all you men are the same. It's not the first gentleman to lose his memory over a liaison I had with him when I was under ten. But <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, had trouble, I had this trouble with the Bishop of Durham recently over a map of lapsed memory. <laughs> yes. Do you remember we were, we were on the same show as Françoise Hardy? We did, yeah. And, 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 Le, and Les Swingle Singers. What happened to Les? Les did very well. He's yeah. gone from strength to strength. I must teach you how to E for knife because you you haven't got that quite right. It goes like this. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, listen, I've got a stylophone here. Any requests for any Stephen? He's got Fox? one here. Would you Have like you? to do a duet? Yes. I, brought, I brought a Jaws harp with me and it goes like this. <laughs> Talent's a wonderful thing, isn't it? <laughs> Isn't it, isn't it wonderful to be talented? Get off. Any, any request for any St Stephen Sondheim song? Because I've, as I've said before, on loose ends, you're only ever a minute away from a St Stephen Sondheim song. <laughs> so what would you like? Come on, requests? Um, can you play the hiccup song? From, yes, uh, right. here we go. Oh, I know it's not, but they all sound like that anyway. So. <laughs> what, about, what about your appearances together at Harrods, uh, Victor? H.A. Rods. 
No, we never, I never appeared with Robert. I did appear in court. Seriously, I did appear in court. A rather unsavoury um, case at the High Courts. Do you remember that, uh, Rolf? I do, where they were trying to prove that the stylophone had to be held in the hand. Well, they uh, tried to prove that it was a music, musical instrument, didn't they? How but, preposterous. Uh, yeah, and uh, <laughs> otherwise there was a million pounds tax to pay. Yeah, and, sorry. Uh, I had to appear in front of three High Court judges with my little organ in my hand as I played. If you're listening, Lord Justice Summon, do you remember our tune? It went like this. It went... <laughs> the same one. That's right, yeah. I was also a founder member of the London Stylophone Group, uh, which was the flagship of the Stylophone Company. Well, I say flagship, it's more like the Titanic, really. But if, if, if the sound of four Stylophones playing sounds like a drilling night at a brain surgeon's workshop, and it sort of like... <laughs> Are you getting that, London? Yeah, yeah we're getting it beautifully. Yeah. Yeah. Have you still got that outrageous hairstyle? <laughs> You've got very little hair now. You've found my, you've gone on my weak point. I also, <laughs> well, at least I've got a word in edgeways. Did, did you yeah. have, uh, remember that arrangement I did of a song? Uh, it was, I think it was Puppet on a String for a Thousand Boys Brigade Stylophonist at the Albert Hall. Do you remember I do, that? I do. I it do. sounded like a, like a sort of incessant tapping, more like a thousand blind men playing Hunt the Thimble. Do you remember that? Was all... <laughs> a thousand of them. <laughs> Listen, before I go, just before I go, can I do a quick impersonation? Yeah, yes. This is Jack Hawkins saying, all hands on deck from the film The Cruel Sea. <laughs> yes, I think we call that the worst possible taste, uh, Victor. We say goodbye. Bye-bye. Uh, Bye.